Gentlemen, a very good morning to you all. Thank you for coming. Uh, and I'm very glad Carsten Fink is here, our Chief Economist, who's the, who directed the work on this report. Uh, as Summer has said, we publish these reports every two years. So we published the first one on uh, the changing face of innovation, uh, now some four years ago, and the second one on brands, brands, uh, reputation and image in the global marketplace, and this one, as Sama has also mentioned, on breakthrough innovation and economic growth. So what's the idea here? Just some preliminary words, if I may. Well, first of all, economic growth, you're all uh, extremely familiar with, uh, and while one can't consider it a panacea for all uh, problems in the world, it is, of course, uh, extremely important, and I think you're very familiar uh, with the reasons why it's important. It improves living standards, creates new employment opportunities, and helps alleviate poverty. So uh, we are all very much focused on economic growth as one of the uh, uh, essential components, really, of our economic analysis of the state of the world. Uh, now, uh, can we take economic growth for granted uh, and our experience since the global financial crisis, of course, in 2008, is one in which uh, ec economic growth rates have consistently disappointed. Year after year, since 2008, we've seen uh, disappointing uh, growth rates and uh, various people are raising the question as to whether low growth is the new normal, as they say. Uh, and that uh, is one of the things that has driven us to the theme this year because part of the answer uh, in terms of economic growth is innovation. Not necessarily all of the answer, but part of the answer is certainly innovation. And historically, major breakthroughs in technological innovation, te technological progress, have been the root of long-lasting expansions of economic growth. Uh, so, uh, in and in many ways, what we see in the 21st century, of course, is an acceleration of innovation activity, certainly uh, an acceleration of interest, a concentration of interest in innovation. But uh, how far uh, are the breakthroughs of today going to take us tomorrow? And that r remains an open question. Uh, our next link, of course, is intellectual property, and intellectual property is uh, a, an essential but not sufficient condition or component of a healthy innovation eco uh, ecosystem. Uh, however, the way in which it operates to support innovation is complex, and it does vary uh, across technologies and different forms of intellectual property. So it's to shed light on these channels in particular, that is, the influence of intellectual property, to be a bit more uh, subtle and sophisticated about our analysis of intellectual property's influence in relation to innovation, in turn in relation to economic growth, that we have focused this report on breakthrough innovations and, um, and uh, economic growth. Uh, the report presents a study, a, a, a series of case studies. There are six case studies, three about historical technological breakthroughs and three about uh, contemporary technological, or what are thought to be contemporary technological breakthroughs. So the three historical studies are air, aeroplanes, antibiotics, and semiconductors. And the three contemporary breakthroughs or potential breakthroughs uh, 3D printing, nanotechnology, and robotics. Uh, briefly, then, what are the report's main findings? Well, first of all, it emphasises once again uh, the elements of successful innovation ecosystems. Namely, first of all, government support uh, and funding for scientific research and support for moving uh, through the complex process uh, of uh, moving technology from the labor laboratory to the production stage. Uh, secondly, competitive market forces that encourage firms to innovate, uh, supported by vibrant financial markets and sound regulation, uh, and then fluid linkages between the public and private uh, 
institution uh, or innovation actors. Uh, one of the first findings or main findings is that breakthrough innovation remains geographically concentrated, uh, relying on patent mapping, which we've done in uh, the report, it shows that six countries uh, accounted for 75% of all-time patent filings in the areas of 3D printing, nanotechnology and robotics, the three potential breakthrough areas. Uh, and those six countries are perhaps no surprise, Japan, United States, Germany, France and the United, King United Kingdom and the Republic of Korea. Uh, China is the only emerging middle-income country that's moving up closer to this group of countries. Uh, <clears throat> and looking at more recent history, <clears throat> so the first figures I gave you were for all-time activity. Is this or across the board? Um, well, I'll give you, okay. across the, I gave you 3D printing, um, nanotechnology and robotics, <clears throat> all time figures. Now if you look more recent history, patents filed since 2005, China accounts for more than a quarter of patents worldwide in 3D printing and robotics. Okay? So it's a good indication that uh, here's a new player in the uh, uh, group of the big actors in this area. Uh, it also shows the report uh, or documents how uh, innovation is increasingly linked to universities and research institutions. That's something I think that we've spoken about in the past that we uh, know about. So if you take again the three potential breakthroughs, uh, 3D printing, nanotechnology and robotics, it shows higher shares of patenting uh, compared to the historical cases. Uh, of aeroplanes, air, antibiotics and semiconductors for universities and public research institutions. And nanotechnology in particular is a standout with academic applicants, uh, applicants accounting for around a, a quarter of patenting worldwide. Uh, an another important filing, uh, finding is that uh, innovation has flourished as a result of knowledge sharing mechanisms. Uh, so historically, the first clubs of amateur airplane inventors to more contemporary uh, models of open innovation in 3D printing and robotics. And we believe that intellectual property is an important mechanism in this because it provides for, first of all, disclosure uh, and secondly, a very flexible tool for managing <coughs> cooperative arrangements in relation to research and development, for example, by licensing. Uh, now, uh, will those three that we've looked at, which are potential areas, uh, you know, change the world tomorrow in terms of economic growth? That's an open question. And for that, besides listening to Carsten, I would encourage you to come to our panel this afternoon in which we have three uh, outstanding uh, economists who will be uh, uh, participating in a discussion about this matter. <coughs> so perhaps I, if I may I'll hand over to Carsten. Thank you <coughs> Director General and good morning to everyone. Uh, I won't say much uh, just to emphasize that Really, one original contribution of our report is uh, the mapping of patents uh, for the six fields of innovation that uh, the Director General uh, mentioned. Uh, so through a variety of techniques, uh, we did our best to identify all the patent documents in international patent databases. Uh, and sometimes, interestingly for airplanes, you know, that uh, goes back uh, to the 19th uh, century. Now, this is not a statistical report. You know, we'll present our um, main flagship statistics report, our world IP indicators, uh, in December. Um, but I think uh, that as journalists, you might be interested uh, in you know, some of the um, um, statistics that emerge out of our patent mapping. Uh, so specifically, if you look at page 13 uh, in the executive summary, 
you, for example, would find the top 10 applicants uh, for the nanotechnology, 3D printing, and, and robotics fields. Uh, so a US company called 3D Systems, which is a specialized uh, 3D printing company, uh, is the top filer for 3D printing. Um, Samsung Electronics of the Republic uh, of Korea emerges as the top filer for nanotechnology, and uh, Toyota of Japan is the top filer for robotics. Um, now also what is important to keep in mind when you look at these figures, uh, these are all-time patent filings, uh, so whenever um, patenting in those uh, fields uh, of technology uh, started to, to emerge until the latest available data. And also when we report <coughs> patent filing figures here, uh, we look at a concept called first patent filings. Uh, so we look at whenever um, companies or universities or individuals really present new inventions to patent offices, uh, uh, because we feel that is the closest we get to the concept of a new invention, um, and you know that is ultimately what uh, we want uh, to measure. Uh, finally, the patent mappings also tell us um, something about where companies seek protection for their inventions. Uh, so um, the figures uh, that the Director General mentioned uh, you know, when we report that uh, patent filings are highly concentrated, that is in terms of origin, that you know, is approximately where the innovation takes place. Uh, we also look at you know, where are those inventions protected. Uh, and it turns out that you know, there is strong correlation. It is also the high income markets uh, that, um, you know, where most of the patents uh, in the fields of 3D printing, nanotechnology, and robotics uh, um, are, are filed. Um, low and middle income countries on average receive less than 3% of patents filed worldwide uh, in these uh, three innovation fields. Uh, I think that has to do with the fact uh, that high-income countries are the economies that, of course, uh, offers the largest markets for these technologies, but also these are the countries that host uh, the um, technologically most sophisticated competitors. Uh, so this is where um, you know, companies uh, want uh, to um, protect their technologies. Um, this is all... Um, I wanted to say, um, of course, this is a this is a rich report. I think each of these case studies, um, you know, has interesting conclusions. Um, sometimes it's hard to generalize them, but we'd be happy to, to answer any questions you may have on the report. Yes, Jean-Pierre. Yeah, I have two questions. I mean, how, how did you choose the three subjects? And uh, there was a report uh, I didn't see it from UNESCO a few days ago, saying that the uh, Innovations, in, investment in um, innovations uh, increased by, I don't know, 40% in the last few years, but, but there's still no effect on the economic growth. So that contradicts uh, what we've been saying days ago. <laughs> I'm not sure. Well, it's a question of time factor, isn't it? But Carsten had a shot and. and uh, on the something. first one, how do we choose those? Um, um, certainly, there is an element of arbitrariness. We purposely wanted to look at specific fields of breakthrough innovation. Um, also, you know, we are quite interested in the role of intellectual property, and um, you know, it's quite insightful to look at this in, in concrete terms. Um, we did do a lot of reading um, before choosing uh, these fields of, of breakthrough innovations, and I think we can fairly say that the three historical ones that, and also the three um, current ones really appear quite prominently on lists of major innovations of the 20th century, for example. And also, when it comes to discussions on what might uh, drive growth in the future, nanotechnology, 3D printing, and robotics uh, are frequently uh, mentioned. Now, we don't pretend uh, to, to, to know that these are the ones you know, that really will really become important. Uh, we wanted to you know, select a few because we have uh, resource limitations, um, um, so we probably can't claim generality. But I would say that you know these are the ones that you know, are certainly of, of some importance. Um, and I think on the second question, I think that's also something that emerges, especially from the historical case studies. I think you know from the viewpoint of I would say both policy making and business, um, perseverance is important. Um, you know innovations often take years and decades to really you know, materialize in, in terms of economic growth, uh, especially when innovations 
transform economic structures when they're at the root of new industries, when um, there's need uh, to acquire new skills in the workforce, you know, that's not something that you would expect to happen from one year to, to, to the next. Uh, so one really has to have a long-term perspective here. I would also, if I may, uh, suggest that the, the, the linkage, the nexus that you draw is a little bit too uh, uh, abrupt. Uh, you could say, you could say, where would we be if there had not been that innovation? So, I mean, I think we'd have to analyse the components of economic growth and look at what the contribution of innovation was, and then there is a the time factor. Right, but can you confirm these figures of UNESCO? I don't know why they got them. I haven't seen them, I but I imagine it comes out of the UNESCO Institute for uh, Statistics. I've forgotten what its uh, yes. precise name is. Uh, and there is also, well, there are various, you know, uh, reports around the world of uh, uh, that seek to document the amount of investment in R and D. Of course, the National Science Foundation does it. The OECD does it as well. So I'm I'm not sure without seeing those. Maybe if I can make one more point, which we also make in the report, it is certainly true if you look at various indicators of innovation activity, you know, that certainly includes the R&D statistics that UNESCO publishes, but it also includes our own patent filing statistics. I think one can probably say that never ever has the world invested so much in, in innovation. Um, but it's also the case that you know, technological uh, problems are increasingly complex uh, and finding solutions to them is not is certainly not getting any easier and there is a discussion where we don't take a position but there is a discussion among academics uh, there's some academics who argued that it may be hard to match the achievements of some of the past uh, technological breakthroughs so if you look at an areas of of health um, you know we have antibiotics in the report antibiotics was really at the root of major expansions in life expectancy and decline in mortality. You know, average life expectancy at the beginning of the 19th century was, was somewhat below 50 years. Uh, in high-income countries, it's generally above 70 years. In Japan, it's even above uh, 80 years. Uh, and you know, um, you know, even if one is optimistic about um, uh, some of the things that are happening in, in the biosciences field, you know, there is a question can we see you know, similar leaps, let's say, in, in terms of you know, increases in life expectancy, speed of travel, um, communication, as we have seen in the past? Uh, again, we don't take a position, but I think that's, that's an important question. Uh, Tom and then John. Uh, Tom Miles from Reuters. Um, I have a technical question, first of all, which is about these graphs. I noticed that you do comparison um, two sets of years, one is 95 to 2001, the other one's 2005 to 2011. I just wonder, what, you know, it's a sort of strange way of, of having two chunks of history where well, there's a gap in between. I don't know whether it matters, but I just wonder whether that's, well, you know, why you chose those periods in these graphs on, on paper. Yeah, I mean, there is, there is no particular reason we could have, well, I mean, I guess we wanted to have a comparison, you know, um, to what has happened in the 90s and what happened in, in more, more recent history. Um, I think in the, these charts are also summary charts of, you know, essentially you have the full time series then in, in, in the chapter. So this was what, just one way of summarizing it. And okay. um, so the questions I want to ask, I have two questions. One is, what should we read into China having such a predominance of, uh, um, well, I guess it's universities or sort of state or non-enterprise um, organizations uh, taking out patents? And secondly, um, from your historical study, have you concluded anything about um, countries getting a first mover advantage in, in patents? Because it seems like um, you know, Japan did all the semiconductor patenting for years and years and years, but then there was a huge growth in other countries joining in. And, and you know, I mean, I guess Japan is an important player, but is it true to say that countries are, um, are, are too late to join in, I don't know, for the robotics or nanotechnology patenting now? I think these are really good questions. Yes, they are. <laughs> well, look, on China, uh, of course, it's, it, it's a, an economy that's organized uh, in, a, in a different manner. So um, if you have the state as a principal actor in the economy, uh, then a question arises as to how they're going to uh, channel their investment in research and development. Uh, and 
there are state-owned enterprises on the one hand, and there are the research and development institutions and uh, universities on the other hand. Uh, so I think it's a question of strategic choice on the part of uh, the Chinese leadership. Uh, and then the extent to which state-owned enterprises and other enterprises take up investment in research and development uh, will be a function of, of their particular uh, strategies. And I, I suppose that what we see is that, of course, it's heavily dominated by the state, the investment in research and development. Does, does that mean, for example, that there'll be a wider field of uh, people who can take that uh, intellectual property and develop it rather than just one small lab in a company like yeah. HP or whatever in, in the States that we're doing it? Possibly. China has introduced this year the equivalent of the Baidol Act. So the Baidol Act was a major piece of legislation. The Baidol Act, uh, B-A-Y-L, I think, uh, D-O-H-L, a major piece of legislation in the 1980s, so 1984 if I'm not mistaken, in the United States. Uh, to get the results of research and development that has been funded in the public sector into the productive sector. So it's a very market-oriented measure, and interestingly, China has adopted that measure within the last 12 months. So it's a measure to get uh, this research uh, into the productive economy. Uh, so. Uh, yes, it. it uh, we will we'll see what happens, I suppose. And your second, I'm sorry, question. The question was, um, was it? I just wonder whether it matters to, to whether yeah. particular. Okay, I, I was. Yes. In the early stages, well, know? I'm sure it does, and Carsten might have something to say about that. But let me, if I may, say one other thing, which is there are breakthrough sectors, uh, and there are breakthrough innovations within a sector. So. Uh, it's interesting to look at the whole, how the whole sector, uh, you know, uh, performs and who's dominant in it. But if you look at semiconductors, of course, then the Kilby patent of Texas Instruments in 1962 was the fundamental invention in the whole field. Of course, a lot has happened since then, but it was a fundamental invention in the, in the whole field, which started, it was the semiconductor you know, the original integrated circuit. Maybe one or two observations on China. First, a clarification on the data. So the data, when we report shares of university and public research organization, these are really universities and public research organization and not state-owned companies. Uh, state-owned companies would, you know, show up as, as corporations in our data. Also, these findings are quite specific to the three um, technologies at hand, if one looks at others, for example, at digital communications, uh, there you have a much stronger presence uh, of companies uh, in um, the patenting landscape. This is something that uh, we um, um, you know, frequently uh, point out when we publish our, our statistics report. Now, I think there may be two ways one, one could look at um, you know, the high presence of universities and public research organization in, in China. One way is to argue that, well, maybe, you know, in these areas, the capacity of the private sector, um, you know, to commercialize technology is, 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 you know, relatively more limited. Obviously, in a large economy like, like China, it's, it's, it's there. I think the more, um, you know, sort of long-term <coughs> view on this is, and, you know, there I can at least give you one sort of um, piece of evidence from our case studies is that, you know, the fact that, you know, China has sort of a scientific capacity, you know, with a commercial orientation as reflected in the patent filings may prove to be important in the future. Um, and to give you one example um, from our report, which is the example of airplanes. And as we all know, there is some controversy, but, um, you know, the first uh, flight of the flying machine, you know, took place in the United States by the Wright brothers. But it was then subsequently... Germany, where sort of you know, Germany was at the center of airplane development, and that's where most of the technological progress occurred. What our case study seems to suggest is that that was largely because of a um, sort of strong prior scientific um, um, capacity. Um, when the Wright brothers um, invented uh, the airplane, they really didn't understand how you know, why an airplane flew. It was largely trial and error. And that only happened later on, um, 
Now, the environment in Germany was one where many of the pilots had a scientific background, where many of the entrepreneurs that drove airplane development has, had close links to the science system. And that environment turned out to be extremely fruitful um, you know, for airplane development. And you know, only later, when the United States sort of then became, um, after the Second World War, a leader in airplane development, a lot of that was due to German scientists actually um, moving to, to the United States. Uh, I think the only point I want to make here is that, you know, yes, I think these initial conditions matter. I think uh, there's a lot of serendipity in there. They are often hard to predict. Uh, but I think in the case of China, you know, one sort of has to assess that, you know, maybe in 20 or 30 years, uh, then looking back at history. May I offer one other comment on your uh, uh, third question, I think. I'm much less scientific than uh, Carsten. But I think there is a certain amount of evidence to suggest that science and technology are coming closer together. Mm -hmm. uh, one such piece of evidence is when they examine patent applications, they look at what is technically called the prior art, that is, what has gone before, and we see that scientific articles are cited increasingly uh, as well as patents. So they're looking at science as much as technology, if you like, uh, as relevant to the new inventions that are being examined. And that's well documented. Uh, and uh, this is a tendency, I think, that, that explains the larger activity of universities and research institutions in patenting. John? Yes, coming back to your, your table on page 13, I'm very intrigued to find out of the companies that have filed, how many have moved um, fast into the development phase other than what's the time gap between the invention and moving into something concrete? Uh, and if you have figures on the R&D for how much is spent by these companies, uh, because that would be interesting, uh, how much is that is, are they licensing this research? Are they making the, the, the patents in cooperation with others or, or and they're taking the lead? And secondly, um, does, does your research include the huge R&D done by ministries of defense, a lot of it which is classified, especially in nanotechnology and robotics, a lot is being done in ministries of defense. Um, is that captured in your report? Well, the R&D figures capture the uh, defense expenditure on R&D that, that are collected. Another source, by the way, to in addition to those that we've mentioned, uh, that you can look at is Battelle. Uh, Institute, which publishes a report on R&D each year, and it does go into different industry sectors in more detail. Uh, so yes, that is, but look, on the commercialization process, well, we don't have, and I think there's not a press conference in which you don't ask that question, in which I don't apologize for the absence of the information, uh, but we don't have uh, that information uh, that data, uh, it would require you to analyse the accounts of every single country, uh, company. Uh, and those accounts in this regard are not necessarily immediately transparent because, of course, for an enterprise that's operating multinationally, um, it has a complex structure, many subsidiaries, and it uh, uh, takes advantages of different fiscal regimes, uh, so it's difficult to get precise uh, figures on this and it requires uh, some work that we have not yet done. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I don't have much, uh, I mean, as usual, you ask the toughest uh, questions, just to highlight that, of course, you know, patent data are very useful because you have unit record data, you know, you know what is being patented by whom and so on. Um, but, of course, you know, patents are not a perfect proxy of innovation. So to the extent that you know, innovation never, in some sense, sees the day of light or is never published through the patent system, 
no, it wouldn't show up in, in our figures. We do, in the various case studies, also report uh, uh, some data on research and development. We also report uh, data on scientific publications, uh, which is another way of, of you know, sort of looking at uh, innovation output. Um, but on commercialization, as, as the Director General mentioned, it's, it's rather difficult. No, because this is linked to economic growth, so yeah. the time yes. gap is critical here. Yes, yes. You would find qualitative dis discussion on this, but you know, we wouldn't be able to tell you for, you know, let's say, the top patent filers in these fields of innovation, what they're commercializing, when they're commercializing. Yeah. So I'm just yeah. coming back to Francis's example of um, Texas Instruments, mm. 1962, but the whole thing took off in a big way in, in the 80s. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, and there are other examples of this. Television uh, is, uh, I can't give you on the top of my head the exact um, dates, but television was invented about 30 years before it was commercialised. Um, and um, another example is the jet engine. Uh, that was also invented a long time before it was commercialised. Uh, but that's not to say there's not a lot of incremental invention uh, and innovation that follows the initial breakthrough foundation, if you were, idea. In uh, knowledge sharing, do you also include the industrial espionage? <laughs> <laughs> no. No, oh, what role does industrial espionage play? I mean, it must be a big percentage of... Well, if we knew... <laughs> Uh, but that's the problem. Look, there are all sorts of an anecdotal uh, evidence about the uh, increase of industrial espionage because of uh, the vast capacity, technological capacity, to store data now uh, and, and the vulnerability that that produces. Uh, so we hear a lot about that, of course. But by definition, we're not supposed to hear about espionage. You know, if it's successful, we won't uh, really know about it. But um, it highlights a different area of intellectual property, which is really trade secrecy. Uh, and trade secrecy is, uh, on, in the view of many, becoming more important uh, because of, first of all, the vulnerability, and because, secondly, uh, of knowledge sharing mechanisms such as global value chains because you can't have a global value chain without sharing a certain amount of information and so your exposure uh, is increased and because thirdly of the mobility of people, uh, skilled resources who can take information with them uh, and perhaps fourthly because you have the, the patent is the, the core of the invention, but there's a lot of information that surrounds it which can be very valuable, but it's not absolutely essential for the patent application. Uh, and um, this is certainly the case in some of the areas of the biosciences that rely on, on vast amounts of data that they process. And none of that is an invention, the data, but the data is valuable and has been collected and uh, is tempting. Um, I was wondering, are, do you think it uh, would be beneficial for more countries to get involved in this? Uh, to, and also, when you're talking about um, commercialization, do you think that, um, you were talking about the television that took 30 years, but today the world is sped up. Mm. Uh, you know, how quickly is it going now? It seems like you, know, you have an innovation and it's commercialized tomorrow. Uh, well, on the first part, I think it's a strategic question for a country. You know, so obviously we know broadly the linkages between technological progress, let's say, or innovation and economic growth. Uh, then, you know, it's up to a country to devise its own particular strategy as to how it, it matches its eco economic possibilities with that fact and where it's going to place itself. And there are various different forms of strategy, such as, for example, smart specialization, you know, where you might concentrate on one particular or several particular areas where you think you might have a comparative advantage. Uh, so it's really a strategic question for uh, uh, economists and the government in each particular country. Uh, on the second one, 
I don't think I can make anything resembling a scientific comment on you know, whether there is this acceleration, as you suggest. Everything that we would you know, think as laypersons would suggest uh, that maybe there is this acceleration because you have so much activity in, in innovation now, and if you just went back 100 years, obviously it was a vastly different scene, uh, and many of the much of life is accelerated now, so you would you would expect that, but I can't give you a scientific <laughs> uh, explanation, Carsten, maybe. We actually have a figure in the report that speaks to that uh, on page 11, figure 3, and this draws on work that uh, an economist named Diego Common at Harvard Business School has undertaken. He and, um, together with some other economists, they've built a database of how major technological innovations have spread through the world. And I suppose there is good news and bad news coming out of that. The good news is exactly what you mentioned. If you look at the average adoption lag, um, that adoption lag is much shorter today than it was in the past. So you look at you know, s um, steam and motor ships uh, that uh, were first adopted uh, in uh, the early 19th century, um, it took more than 100 years, essentially, for economies around the world, on average, to adopt uh, that particular technology. You look then at cell phones and the internet, um, you know, those technologies are adopted uh, essentially within a few years after their first uh, sort of commercial introduction. Now, the more worrying news concerns the level of use of these technologies within those countries. So what the second chart on the right-hand side shows you is um, the difference in, in penetration rates of these technologies relative uh, to, to high-income countries. And there we see that the newer technologies you know, are sort of less intensively used um, you know, in, in, in poorer economies. That at first might seem surprising, especially if one you know, sees how widely cell phones and the internet have spread to developing countries. But if you have a close look at the data, it just turns out that these technologies are far more heavily used uh, in, in developed countries. Uh, so in a sense, you know, that um, is, is good news and bad news. So technologies uh, seem, to, seem to spread you know, faster. But their intensity of use, you know, the differences across countries, you know, seem to be on the increase. And uh, if you go back a very long time, you know, in support of what you say, uh, it took 4,000 years uh, to move from uh, hunter-gatherer to um, settled agriculture and urbanisation in the Fertile Crescent. So that process actually took about 4,000 years. So we certainly seem to be a little bit quicker, mm. I think, now. Merci, Mon. And you, you mentioned that the innovation were geographically very concentrated among six countries. Uh, any surprise in this, in this report uh, on mm. these three, uh, three sectors? Mm. Any surprise? Mm. Well, I think. What you say in itself, I think, is quite interesting because you look at the three historical ones and we are really talking about you know, the early 20th century here. So it seems like the, the group of leading innovators hasn't changed much in the course of more than 100 years. And that also applies you know, for um, essentially um, you know, for the performance of economies. You look at the top 10 economies in the middle of the 19th century, you look at the top 10 economies in terms of GDP per capita. Um, today, if I remember correctly, I think there are only two economies that were able to break into the, into the top 10 group, which I believe are Sing Singapore and Hong Kong. Um, so there seems to be a lot of persistence as far as sort of you know, innovation goes, but also as far as, as uh, economic success goes. Uh, I would say, listen, I mean, this is a big question, and I, I, I think there's, you know, even, even the brightest economists working on this uh, don't necessarily have a one-line one line answer to that. Uh, but I think it is the case that, you know, initial conditions uh, matter. I think, you know, the emergence of China, um, which, you know, by historical standards is still a relatively new phenomenon, I think is, is something that's, that's really um, remarkable. Um, you know, that's certainly not news to you, given that, you know, we have presented a lot of patent statistics uh, or IP statistics on China 
uh, on, on, on previous occasions. Um, and that's where I would leave it. You could also b perhaps add, as an example, the Republic of Korea, and yes. I don't have the figures, but if you yes, go back to the true. early 60s, you find an extremely, one of the lowest uh, per capita GDPs in the world. Yes. Uh, and now, of course, it's in a vastly different position, and technology has played a major part in that. spoken about the Premier League players and the, and, and the First League players. Uh, now, uh, if you look at the, your map on Nano Technology on page 117 and 113, there is a little bit of colour in emerging economies such as South Africa and Brazil. I wonder if uh, you can comment on whether or not the flat economic syndrome that the world has entered impacts the emerging economies more than the mm, right. Well, not only flat, but also the poorer performance of the emerging economies in the last couple of, last little while. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I have a lot of intelligent things to say about this. It is certainly the case, you know, that, you know, we broadly make this distinction between let's say, those leading economies, high-income countries, and one would add China to that, and other low- and middle-income countries. But even within that, there's a lot of, um, you know, variation. Certainly, you know, countries such as Brazil, South Africa, also India in some areas have, um, you know, centers of excellence, uh, especially on the scientific front. You know, if you look at, for example, their um, journal publications output, uh, in, in some cases, it's, it's quite impressive. Um, but, you know, in, in, in terms of levels, it's still considerably below what you would find uh, in, you know, in, in, in the group of technological leaders. Uh, it's also the case um, that certainly the more volatile um, history and, you know, that applies till the state of growth performance in these economies, you know, presents a challenge in sustainably funding innovation in these countries. Um, and, um, you know, that's certainly something that Brazil struggles with these days. The, um, the, the three technology, particularly nanotechnology and uh, no, uh, robotics and 3D printing, yes. create uh, jobs, but also destroy jobs. Yes. Uh, do you have any comment on, on that? And, uh, well, only peripherally, and we are quite explicit about this um, at the outset. It is a really important topic, uh, you know, that uh, one, 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 you know, certainly can't set aside. Um, and it was mainly for, you know, space reasons that, you know, we felt if we do it, we have to give proper treatment to that. And, you know, we probably would have easily, um, you know, increased the report in half. Um, now... You know, we certainly make the argument that um, the, um, let's say, replacement or redundancy of jobs in the long term is not necessarily a bad thing. So if you, for example, look at the early days of, you know, analog uh, to, to telephony, you know, you had all these manual switching operators um, whose job essentially become redundant uh, the day, you know, direct dialing was invented. Uh, and that in the long term is a good thing because it frees up labor in, in the economy, you know, that essentially can be used productively in, in other areas of the economy. Um, but it is something that, um, you know, first of all, creates hardship for people who lose their work. It requires management. And it is something, you know, that, you know, sometimes may take a, take a generation. And I think, you know, sort of dealing with all of this is, is an important challenge for policymakers. And I think it's an important um, challenge because you know effectively managing that transition, you know, is um, you know, is, 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 is essentially a pre-condition for successfully reaping the growth benefits uh, of new innovation. Mm, I would like to add a personal comment, if I may, mm -hmm. to your question, and I'll leave the report and uh, you know emphasise that it's a, a very personal view. Um, and of course, we're dealing with predictions, and and predictions are, are you know. Um, extremely risky, but I would say that there uh, uh, that we should. This is an ex what you your question is extremely profound question, uh, and it, it, an extremely profound effects may be seen. 
may be seen in the future. First of all, because uh, what we've seen in the 1990s, you know, uh, in part because of of the uh, TRIPS agreement, uh, and it would rather not the TRIPS agreement, excuse me, the Doha, the Uruguay round, yeah, yeah the Uruguay round, uh, and in part because of globalization, is that a lot of jobs in the uh, low technology areas were exported offshore from developed countries. Uh, and that worked to the advantage of developing countries. Now, if robotics and other advanced manufacturing techniques, sensors, 3D printing, and so on, uh, hold all the promise that is suggested, then it may be that uh, some manufacturing will be recaptured by developed countries. And so the first effect in the longer term may be that a redistribution of what we have seen happening in, re in respect of manufacturing in the course of the last 20 years or the course of the 1990s and 2000s. So that is uh, one possible scenario that may emerge from advanced manufacturing. And there are certain other reasons to support that, such as the view that innovation follows manufacturing, and therefore it's important to retain manufacturing or to recapture manufacturing. And a second, it, there is a view that innovation follows manufacturing. Not all innovation, but some innovation follows manufacturing, uh, uh, and therefore it's important to retain manufacturing or to recapture it. Uh, so that's a distributional effect that is possible, possible out of uh, advanced manufacturing technologies. Uh, the other thing is the one that uh, Carsten has been talking about, which is that we may well find ourselves in a position in which uh, work is a scarcer uh, phenomenon. Uh, and that, again, carries within it, if that occurs, uh, the r risk, if you like, or the challenge of a completely different way of looking at uh, the way in which we organise ourselves as society. Uh, Keynes wrote about this in a letter to his grandchildren in which he suggested that uh, in 50 or 60 years' time, you know, uh, work would be much reduced as a phenomenon in society and maybe this will occur. Um, in the future. So that's the other possibility uh, that I think we need to reflect on in, in the whole area of advanced manufacturing. It's not just the redistribution, the potential redistribution, but also what happens in our own societies. This is, uh, in other words, the digitisation of work.